All right, my name is Chris Hillio. I'm a CPU architect at Esperanto. And today I'm going to talk about how to secure high performance RISC-V processors from time speculation. Uh, this is um, essentially to deal with a new breed uh, of speculation based timing attacks. Um, we've known that timing attacks are a problem for a couple of decades now. If you write a crypto algorithm, you want to make sure that the amount of time that crypto algorithm takes doesn't depend on the value of a secret key. Otherwise, an attacker can measure how long that takes and then infer something about how, how, uh, your key. Now, we thought that this was otherwise a mostly academic problem until Meltdown and Spectre um, have essentially made this clear that this is a problem that we all have to deal with now, uh, that essentially someone can access data that they can't otherwise uh, or shouldn't be able to see. Um, unfortunately, I don't have time to really go into how Meltdown and Spectre work, other than I just want to say that this is where a user um, or, say, a sandboxed uh, ad on your browser can read memory that it shouldn't be able to access. And what's really disconcerting about this is that this can access um, uh, that this is, uh, impacts not just a processor or a company's of processors. This essentially hits at any processor uh, that uses speculation and cares about performance. Uh, and the really disconcerting thing is, is actually what do we what do we do about this? Um, the reaction in the community was one of abject horror. Uh, this is a Cornell professor, computer architecture researcher, Adrian Sampson, says on Twitter, his gut reaction, I have no idea what to do about Spectre. The more I think about it, the less I understand it. Uh, and the weirdest part is that it's not clear what the next generation of CPUs should do in response. That's unfortunate, because we in this room are working on the next generation of CPUs. Uh, so hopefully I've scared you into paying attention. Um, th the takeaway from this talk is I essentially want to say that we can still build high-performance speculative processors that are protected against timing attacks, and we don't have to modify the ISA to do this. We don't have to add speculation barriers. We don't have to have the operating system hold our hand. We can do this all in the microarchitecture. Now, that's not to say that we can't get better performance or, or, or um, other sorts of nice features, but we don't have to do this in terms of providing uh, protected processors. Um, so a timing attack is where if I change my programmer input or my program input, this affects the amount, uh, the performance seen by some other program. So you have a malicious attacker. He runs a program. He observes some behavior. And if someone else is on the machine, he sees a change in his own program's behavior. And he can start to infer something from this. Uh, take it from faith on me. I can learn everything about you using this technique. Um, I wish I had the time to go into it, but this is, is pretty crazy. This actually works. Um, again, these slides will be online so you can see exactly how a specter attack works. The point that I wanted to hit here, though, is that there's three parts to a timing attack. One, the victim runs code that leaks an observable side effect. Two, the attacker runs code that is affected by that timing uh, leak. And three, the attacker measures the time his code took to run. So where do we break the chain? Uh, can we prevent the victim from running bad code? In a lot of cases, yes, uh, but not in all cases. Uh, can we prevent the side effects from being leaked? Uh, hopefully, but that's kind of hard to do. And can we prevent the attacker from measuring time? That one feels easy, but it turns out uh, the answer is no. Uh, a quick response from Chrome was to lower the resolution of their performance counter, but attackers are just going to build their own. Um, Unfortunately, I don't have time to really go into this uh, idea, but I'll just kind of leave this as a question to the audience. What does, for example, the RISC-V cycle counter or the RISC-V time instruction actually mean? Uh, this is one of these, it's up to the platform, uh, counts up from some arbitrary time in the past. Uh, I don't know if that's 1972 or if that's when the thread got rescheduled. Uh, I guess that's something that we have to figure out. Um, a time domain, this is kind of an idea that maybe uh, you know, one time domain, sh its performance shouldn't affect the, the performance of another time domain. Uh, now, the question, of course, is where does the boundary of a time domain go? And the response is that this is for the customer or the architect to decide where they want to draw their, their boundaries. So kind of a takeaway from this talk is, is that you don't have to build a processor that completely isolates all sorts of time leaks um, depending upon how you want to uh, deploy that processor. So today, the entire SOC is a time domain, and maybe that works if you're Amazon and you're willing to give each customer their own machine. But you want to save money, so you actually want to give each customer maybe their own core. So it's OK for there to be timing leaks within cores, uh, but maybe um, not across cores, depending upon how, how you're using your machine.
And for our laptops, unfortunately, things like our ads are running you know, hyper-threaded with our you know, kernel thread. Uh, and so maybe for our laptops, we need something that is uh, a smaller quantum of time domain. Um, to categorize time leaks, I found this kind of hard to reason about exactly what are the ways to uh, even think about these specter attacks. Uh, so a high level um, category here is, is it a speculative execution that's leaking time, or is it the committed instruction stream that's committing, uh, uh, leaking time? And those kind of give you a bifurcation of the categorization here. Then the question is, where are we leaking from? Are these leaks within the same core, or is it across cores? Is it the operating system, or is it the interface? Uh, and then it's kind of, what are we leaking? If I change data in my program and I see a timing leak, I've leaked data. If I change an address that I'm loading and I see a leak, then I've leaked an address. And you can build these charts and you can actually say that your processor, you know, you can, you can check off what your core protects against and that may be fine for a lot of applications. Um, now I'll, I'll go through uh, a few mitigation techniques uh, for dealing with uh, Spectre. Uh, again, in the interest of time, I'm only going to be focusing on the speculation-based timing attacks. I'm not going to promise these are exhaustive or even sufficient, uh, and I'm not your CPU architect, uh, so uh, don't trust me. Uh, the high-level idea here is two points. Uh, don't leak any observable side effect in the machine if you have to abort your speculation. So you can buffer up your speculation, you can compute off of that speculated data, but you have to kill all of that uh, and if you have to abort your speculation. The second one is really kind of frustrating, which is you have to avoid any sort of bandwidth interference between different time domains. That could be memory traffic going off chip, or that could be bandwidth to a functional unit, um, depending upon, again, where you draw your time domains. Um, one point uh, that uh, helps us think about this is the point of no return. So a modern processor is going to have hundreds of instructions that are in flight. Uh, not all of those instructions are speculative. There's some point in the, in uh, in the ROB where we know that the instruction uh, is not speculated under any branches anymore. It won't throw an exception. These are what I'm going to call safe instructions. And the nice thing is, if we look at some performance data, about 25% of the instructions in the ROB are beyond this point of no return. And so we only have to worry about 75% of the instructions. Uh, the other thing is that we can use this point of no return to our advantage later. Um, so idea number two, uh, don't update predictors speculatively. Um, Spectre and Meltdown used caches to observe uh, the timing leaks, but really any sort of resource where you're storing stuff can leak time. So you could actually use your branch predictor where you're, um, as you're, uh, as you're uh, predicting branches, you add that branch's PC to the uh, BTB, and I can actually measure that that now exists, or maybe that my own entry got kicked out, and I can leak a, a PC that way. Uh, so let's delay these updates until commit, or we'll perform a perfect fix-up. And it turns out that that doesn't have uh, a performance impact. In fact, a lot of processors already do this at commit. Um, it is annoying, though, because you have to buffer some more stuff. Um, let's see. Um, idea number three, don't speculatively update the cache. Uh, this is, as I said, the method of choice for the side channel leaking. And this is a situation where the victim and the attacker share the cache, and that means that the attacker can control what data is in the victim's cache, or vice versa. Um, one option is let's partition the cache, uh, but that seems a little too heavy-handed. Um, we could delay any updates until commit, but then we've ruined performance and we should, we should just give up. Uh, so one idea here is let's go with the fully, uh, let, let's get rid of the fully inclusive L1, L2, L3 caches. Uh, that's kind of the problem here where one core can actually control the contents of another core's cache. So we'll call this a free running cache. Um, the second thing we'll do is we'll only allocate directly into the L1 cache. There's no reason you have to do this part. You could buffer up your, ex, uh, your allocations at the L2 or the L3 levels. Um, but it's kind of hard to be able to um, maybe route the, the kill signal. So let's just say for our purposes, we'll allocate directly to the L1. Um, now, it turns out if that um, load instruction, we have a cache miss, we want the data, it comes back. If the load is now past the point of no return, we can continue to write that directly in the L1 cache. And that turns out that that's a pretty often scenario. However, because we don't want to write things that are speculative into the cache, we'll write them into the store completion buffer. 
So it turns out for a lot of processors, you're already going to have a store completion buffer that sits between the core and the L1 cache. The store completion buffer handles uh, negotiating rights to the cache. It has to handle bypassing to dependent loads. So this is a great structure that already exists. Let's just use this. Uh, and that way, if it turns out we've misspeculated the load, we can just kill that entry in the store completion buffer. And in our simulations, we're only taking about one or two entries away from the store completion buffer. So we're really not hurting performance. We're not hurting FF4 to get this feature. Um, this one is uh, really frustrating. And I apologize. I probably did not title the, the slide correctly. But the basic idea here is that caches, again, aren't the only side channel that Spectre or Meltdown could come through. Um, any shared resource can leak time, in particular, the contention for that shared resource. Um, and so here's a scenario that I came up with using the floating point square root unit. Your attacker measures time. Uh, let, let's say your attacker is a sandboxed um, JavaScript ad. And so he's a user uh, app that you don't trust. And he's going to attack other, he wants to read other user memory that's outside the bounds of the sandbox. So he's going to start by measuring time. He's then going to um, perform a bounds check, but we're going to speculate past the bounds check, because maybe the bounds check is in uh, a cache miss. And every time previously, this was always in bounds, so speculate uh, ahead. And we're going to go off the array, and we're going to read into some secret key value in memory. And then we're going to do a floating point square root based on that key. This goes wrong in three scenarios. The first is that our square root is a variable latency unit. The second is that there's a limited occupancy. So eventually, the floating point square root will back up. And now you can start to see how you might be able to measure the latency of that unit. The third part is that if we discover that we were out of bounds and we want to kill this speculation, we actually can't uh, abort the square root unit. It has to complete its operation before another square root can get queued up. So we had this misspeculation, we abort, we then queue the second square root on the correct path, and then we measure the time that that second square root finishes. In Fuzz, we have figured out uh, how long the first square root took, and we've learned something about what the key is. This seems really highly contrived. Uh, I know of at least one processor that has this, uh, not naming any names. Uh, However, this pattern shows up in a lot of places. This could have been a cache miss. It could have been a load. When you send a load out, uh, how long that load depends on a key. And once you send the load out, you can't kill the load. Um, so this is a really frustrating thing that we have to think uh, very hard about to see what are the resources that we're allocating speculatively that we're showing contention. And we don't want to show contention once we've aborted our speculation. Um, there's a couple other ideas. You can, of course, partition. You can partition your caches. Uh, you can partition your uncore bandwidth. Uh, that's uh, a way that we can prevent other timing domains from perturbing uh, each other. Um, if you do dynamic partitioning, uh, unfortunately, uh, this leaks information, because how much you've decided to allocate one guy versus another can Fuzz give information about what he's up to. Um, however, this is a really useful thing to actually use all the performance your processor has. So maybe if we dynamically uh, change our allocations very slowly, maybe we're still leaking information, but maybe we're leaking it very slowly. So this is something to kind of think about exactly how do we measure do we want to be perfectly safe, or can we make some sort of um, mostly safe judgment? Um, there's, of course, you know, you can flush your resources that you've been allocating to, or you can maybe only partially flush. Uh, an example I like is the BTB. You don't want a user program that's malicious to train the BTB and then call into the OS, and then the OS is going to do something very silly. So you want to make sure that the OS has a clean BTB to work with. But, we, but the BTB can be expensive to repopulate. So let's maybe only flush a quarter of the BTB, hand that over to the OS, and then when the OS returns, we can give that back to the user. Um, I think in the interest of time, uh, there's a whole lot of other ideas that are interesting that we just can't talk about today. Uh, not just speculation-based time attacks, but all timing attacks. Uh, you know, there's questions of how do you test for timing attacks. Um, you know, maybe we can specify some of the address bits uh, to be a time domain ID. I know some of the earlier talks was talking about an object ID. Uh, we can maybe use that to help uh, partition things like your memory controller. 
Um, but kind of in conclusion, what should RISC V do? Uh, I made this slide before uh, you know, this weekend of learning about more security groups. Uh, I think that's really great. Uh, off the top, you know, let's not add any more instructions. Uh, let's you know, have a good um, uh, venue like this to be able to talk about you know, what is good microarchitecture, what's safe microarchitecture design. Uh, the LRISC V platform specifications is a place where we can really open up the processor to be unsecure, or if we collaborate and talk about this, we can make sure that we actually uh, can have a, a secure platform specifications, at least to work off of. Uh, and then let's share our ideas. I think this is too important to get right, or, or sorry, to get wrong. Uh, and all the things that I've talked about today are, are in my slides. Uh, you guys can use these too. We want um, everyone to use ideas. Uh, I want to use your processors. I want to use an Intel processor that's secure. Uh, we want RISC-V to be a successful ISA, and we think in order to do that, we have to have a secure ISA, or at least secure implementations that implement the ISA. Uh, and also, you know, we're going to build high-performance processors, so please provide feedback. If you see obvious holes in this or you have other better ideas, please let us know, because we want to build really good processors too. Uh, and with that, I will yield my time. I, uh, I, I caught you about the uh, recommendation not to add any instructions, but um, is there any plan to allow for a, uh, a common strategy for tagging? Uh, maybe allow people to uh, uh, branch back in their ideas on, for a common tagging architecture to allow compartmentalization and information flow tracking, not so much for timing attacks, but more broadly for yeah, yeah. I think concepts. I think at the IS at the user level, I say I don't think we need to probably add anything. One thing I didn't have time to talk about maybe is a, a, a save and restore instruction where you can maybe black box the microarchitectural state to save off a TLB state or something. Uh, but in general, I think um, there's a lot of place in the platform specification uh, to talk about what can we do with all these address bits. Um, you know, maybe, I don't know if it's really privileged, I think it really is more uh, platform. Maybe what can the OS do to kind of help us? Um, so I think kind of the tagging capability, you know, time domain ID, object ID stuff, I think that's kind of a platform spec. Um, you know, uh, those are great solutions for maybe three years out. You know, for us today, you know, we have to have something that's secure without touching anything. Um, but yeah, there's certainly a, a very much longer term conversation to be had here.